Well, thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I feel deeply honored to start this closing plenary by welcoming the representatives of the political authorities of Switzerland, represented by the President, Estonia, Morocco, Mexico, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates. As we know and we have heard, JESTA is a very young foundation, which was created by the Swiss government, both on the federal level as well as on the cantonal level. And it was created to put the scientific community at the heart of multilateralism. And why we are doing this, and why it was created in this sense, is in order to better address the global challenges that people, society, and our planet keep facing day by day. But we also want to assure that everybody in this world has access to the benefits of technological breakthroughs like it is foreseen in the Human Rights Declaration. Let me just mention very shortly what Shesta really does. Well, I think if you look at the last two days, today is the third one, you see that the first day was dedicated basically to present our main product, which is the Breakthrough Radar, which is summarizing the work and the participation of thousands of scientists from all over the world to tell us what is cooking in these laboratories and what could be seen from their angle, the impact in the next five, 10 or 25 years. That was the first day. The second day, we presented two out of the several solutions which are currently being worked out by the joint workforces between the scientific forum and the diplomatic forum. And those two initiatives were the Open Quantum Institute and the first global curriculum on science diplomacy. Regarding the Open Quantum Institute, which yesterday was presented in detail to you, it is important to mention that today already we have letters signed by 12 universities, eight private companies, two philanthropy and one development institutions uh, letters which are giving the support to the creation of uh, the Open Quantum Institute, and 12 permanent representatives in the UN at Geneva have already publicly announced that they are in favor of the creation of such an institute. The third day today was to give the voice to the young, to give the voice to the citizen, and I think it was very encouraging what we heard from them, but it was also very challenging. And I think that's exactly what we expect from the summit. We don't only want to inform you, we want to get your feedback. And let me say I was impressed by the depth of the discussions we had. But there is something which is new today, because we are starting a new chapter in the preparation by involving for the very first time the political level in our discussion. It is extremely important for Shesta in the first two parts of its work to be as independent, neutral, transparent, and honest as we can. Because that's the only way how we create respect from the science community and the diplomatic community. But Shesta cannot be a substitute to political decision making. So when it comes to the third phase, which is a phase of implementation, that's a moment when we need that the political uh, sphere comes into this phase. And that's exactly what we have here today for the very first time. So I therefore give the floor now to the Swiss Special Representative for Science Diplomacy, our Ambassador, Alexander Fasel, who will moderate the political discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Peter Brabeck, and uh, good morning to you all. Thank you, uh, President of the Board of Directors of JESTA, to have recapitulated the uh, summit so far, what has been done so far, and given us a sense of a perspective. We now come into the segment, the ministerial segment of, of this uh, summit, where ministers will assess together the opportunities and the challenges that come about through scientific anticipation uh, and discuss and give guidance uh, to JESTA and all what I call the force vive that are uh, involved in JESTA's work. We have heard this morning from Peter Maurer that we need to have a large understanding of what governance is. It's not only the state, it's also networks, platforms, communities of practices, um, state and non-state actors, of course. That is in part already taken care of by JESTA, and yet states still are I believe, a central part of the governance setup in multilateral affairs. And to paraphrase a, a French saying, gesta propose et la politique dispose. And that is the conversation we are going uh, to have uh, today. I would like uh, to ask the President of the Confederation to come uh, to the stage to deliver some keynote messages on how he sees the essence of anticipatory science diplomacy as a tool to reinvigorate multilateralism. Monsieur le Président, je vous en prie. Do I use this, Maria? Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador Fazel, for your introduction. Uh, Mr. Chairman of the JESDA Board of Directors, dear Peter, first of all, I'd like to thank you very personally and very deeply for your tremendous efforts to uh, start this new adventure of JESDA. We uh, decided four years ago to start this new way and to make out of it a success story. And uh, I think we are on the right way, and this is mainly due to you and your team. Thank you so much. <clears throat> dear ministers, dear colleagues from abroad, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, can I start by welcoming you all, and especially you, my ministerial colleagues, to the high-level closing plenary of this year's JESDA Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Indeed, I believe it is our role as a political decision makers to accompany JESDA's work, to assess its progress, and, where appropriate, to provide guidance to it. This is because, uh, as we have said from the very beginning, JESDA is not a substitute to the legitimate act actors of uh, governance, but rather a tool at their disposal. A tool that aims at helping them to reinvigorate multilateralism, to focus global governance on the central challenges of our, times, of our time, to develop ways and means to build convergence and construct a shared sense of purpose. This is very much needed today, because the urgency of the challenges, the seriousness of the upheavals, and the rapidity of the change we are experiencing forces the international community to focus on the real and most pressing issues at stake. As the chairman of JESDA has declared in his opening statement on Wednesday, the international community has no time to waste. We must accelerate the diplomatic response to the opportunities and the challenges that are brought about by the convergence of science, of the many different sciences, and the acceleration of technology. 
But we can only do that if we see them coming, if we understand their potential impact for good and ill, if we anticipate them, which is not easy. There is no acceleration of diplomacy in the face of existing problems that already impact us. Once the challenge is here, the opportunity is gone. And we can only run after the problems without any real perspective of mastering them. It is exactly what we see nowadays worldwide. The difficulty is what is that we cannot, as an international community, go straight from anticipate scientific breakthroughs and technological acceleration to negotiating sustain sustainable um, solutions. Whenever we find ourselves in formal negotiation processes, we tend to retreat to our normal ways of functioning. That is to say, we are seeking to maximize our own interests and not really trying to build the common ground. In such a context, we are negotiating for ourselves as individual countries or groups of countries. We are not negotiating for humanity as the global commons. In such a context, the common denominator will remain inadequately low. This is why we need the environment Gesta is suffering as, you've already heard it, an honest broker. An environment where we learn about the medium to long-term anticipation of opportunities and challenges, where we can come together in a real inclusive manner. We have to be courageous to listen to different opinions not just to repeat always the same opinion. It won't be successful if it will be a gathering among just like-minded. We have to expose ourselves to others. We have to find to bring our conversation to a higher level, higher level, sorry, of sophistication, of nuance, of uh, discernment. In such an environment, solutions can mature and ferment, precisely because they are not taken hostage by a formal negotiating process. And so, the legitimate actors of uh, global governance, by which I understand us, the nation states, can then repatriate the draft solutions into existing or new formal processes at the United Nations, for instance, or other international organizations. But we will then be able to proceed from a far higher degree of uh, commonality as would otherwise be possible. And we maybe will be in time and not too late to do that. Therein lies the acceleration of the diplomatic process. This is the nature of what I call anticipatory science diplomacy. Dear ministers, dear colleagues, we as political decision makers are the beneficiaries of this method. Therefore, it was my wish to convene today in Geneva trusted partners and friends, as I said, to discuss this approach developed and implemented by GESDA to assess its progress and where needed or called for to provide guidance in the best share and interest that unites us. I thank you for your, present, for your presence and contribution. I commend the entire JESDA team and all the members of uh, the JESDA fora and task forces for the opportunity they provide us to focus our multilateral action and accelerate our diplomatic efforts. And with this, I invite the Swiss Special Representative for Science Diplomacy, Ambassador Fasel, to take over and moderate our panel. Thank you, Alexander.
Thank you very much, Mr. President. It is now my great honor and pleasure to invite onto the stage the ministers uh, that will, who will participate in uh, this uh, discussion. Can I invite Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of uh, Singapore, her Excellency Madame Sarah Al-Amiri, who is the Minister of State for Public Education and Advanced Technology in, of the United Arab Emirates, and Martina Hirayama, the State Secretary for Education, Research and Innovation um, of Switzerland. We also have with us live Minister Urmas Reinsalu, the Foreign Minister the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of uh, Estonia, and we will also have video messages joining us uh, from Mexico and uh, from um, Morocco. But let's start with a round of opening statement, and I should like to uh, open the proceedings with Minister Balakrishnan, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency Ignacio Cassis, President of the Swiss Confederation, uh, Peter Brabeck, the Chairman of the JESTA Board of Directors, and the men, uh, to quote my good friend Professor Tan Tuoshuan, a Renaissance man who has brought us all together. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to join you here today. I come from Singapore a tiny city-state in the heart of Southeast Asia. So Singapore is uniquely positioned, but we're also exquisitely exposed to both the opportunities and the challenges presented by scientific, diplomatic, and the geopolitical developments, which are occurring simultaneously all around us. Let me make a couple of points. First, we are on the cusp of another profound revolution. And this is based on a very remarkable cocktail of simultaneous and mutually synergistic scientific breakthroughs in several areas. It includes digital computation and communication, data science and artificial intelligence, Biomedical science, which includes genomics, gene editing, immunotherapy, synthetic biology, nanoscience and new materials, autonomous robots, and renewable energy. And what is unusual is that each of these areas of platform technologies, you, we are witnessing breakthroughs, but they're not occurring in isolation because a breakthrough in one area feeds into and sets up a virtuous cycle of acceleration in all the other adjacent areas. So this is a profound moment of acceleration. The second point, to put some context, is that the focal points parts of the globe where this acceleration of science are occurring are not occurring uniformly. Some places it's accelerating, and there are also other places which may be left behind. And it is critical for us to understand what are the underlying factors for these differences in outcomes. For example, what is the optimal role for governments in supporting basic research, in realizing value from its applications, how should universities and research institutions be reorganized in this new age of discovery and innovation? How can the translations of discoveries into new products and services be accelerated? And this involves government playing a role, not simply as a regulator and a producer of rules, but being a proactive enabler, providing the necessary frameworks and infrastructure for progress and excellence, and to translate this research into useful, and if I may add, ethical applications for commercialization. Third point, 
is that the, are our current regimes for intellectual property protection fit for purpose? Have we found the right balance be, between temporary monopolies for inventors and the dissemination of knowledge for wider exploration and exploitation? Equally important for governments is innovation in the policy ecosystem, both national and globally, that will bring together talent, money, and the necessary commercial and industrial players to enable innovation to flourish. Fourth point is that we have all benefited, in the, I would say, in the last century or two, from sharing a common open stack of scientific discoveries based on that shared platform of research, methods, applications, and technology. And one brutal reality is that today, we're now in danger of perhaps a technological bifurcation due to geopolitical contestation. And this will have a profound impact on all of us because it will lead to a more divided world characterized by slower progress, higher costs, greater contestation, and increased risk of, con of conflict. In fact, we're already witnessing these effects with supply chain disruptions, rising cost of living, inflation. And countries today, in managing our supply chains, are thinking in terms of just in case rather than just in time. And you see French shoring in order to ensure continuity and resilience of supply chains. The ripple effects of all this bifurcation goes beyond just science and technology. It risks the decoupling of the global system that have been the enablers for peace and prosperity for the last 75 years after the end of the Second World War. And it raises, therefore, the prospect of a more fractured, more divided, less prosperous, and certainly less peaceful world. If I could just draw your attention to some of the early lessons from COVID-19. Treat this as a real-life work example of the interplay between science, public policy, and the extent of social cohesion and trust within societies. COVID-19 was not the first pandemic and not even the most virulent pandemic that humanity has faced. Yet, it is obvious that our global system for detection, prevention, preparedness and response had major gaps. The global pandemic response highlighted the importance of governments and the private sector working together to address global problems. At the outset of the pandemic, actually, the scientific community was able to get together, was able to publish the genome, actually within weeks, was able to work single-handedly towards devising diagnostic <coughs> kits, and even the development of a vaccine in record time, in months rather than years, which it would normally have taken. That's the good news. But the other half of the equation is that we also discovered that it was social capital within societies, in particular trust between citizens and trust between citizens and the government and scientific authorities that made a critical difference for outcomes. Many people died, even in wealthy societies, not for lack of vaccines or treatment facilities, but because of misinformation, political polarization, which adversely influenced behavior at both the individual and community level. Singapore and Switzerland played a role in co-chairing the Friends of the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access, COVAX facility. And together with other like-minded partners, we pioneered the term vaccine multilateralism which encouraged others to join this collective global effort to ensure the unimpeded, 
a fair and equitable distribution of vaccines. But yet, on this point, it's noteworthy that, in fact, by the middle of this year, vaccine supply at a global level was no longer a limiting factor. Today, if Switzerland or Singapore was to offer free vaccines from our excess stock, no country is willing to accept it. Think about that. I have offered a rather sobering assessment of our world today. But my intention is not to cause alarm or to assign blame, but rather for us to acknowledge the challenge before us and to underscore that, in fact, there is a need to double down, to double down on multilateralism and to effect a concerted global response equal to the scale of this challenge. At the same time, these challenges have also brought unprecedented opportunities and that dramatic advances in science and technology offer new ways of solving major challenges of our generation. If we can harness these advances, if we can mitigate the unwanted downsides and distribute the effects, the benefits more equally across, us, across our globe, then we hold the keys to a better future. Our belief is that the only way forward is to uphold an inclusive and rules-based multilateral system that has underwritten global peace and prosperity for the last 75 to 80 years. Small states like Singapore and even Switzerland have agency and we have a critical role to play. And that's why we work together with a cross-regional group of countries to establish the Forum of Small States in 1992. Groupings such as the FOSS, the Forum of Small States, Today, we account for 108 members in the UN. That is a majority of the UN General Assembly membership. As we celebrate the 30th anniversary of FOSS, my hope is that the world can come together, combining both deft diplomacy and the tremendous potential offered by the inexorable march of science and technological progress to chart a better, brighter, more prosperous and fairer future for all of us. So therefore, I stand here in support of the JESTA agenda. I stand here in support of the agenda outlined by President Cassie. And to make the point that we need to establish a network of people who have both mastery of science and diplomacy and to make a difference by making common cause and especially at this time of historic opportunity and risk. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for uh, your introductory remarks and, and this call to action to double down, uh, to come together uh, for the global commons. Can I now turn uh, to Tallinn and welcome Minister Rein Salo, Foreign Minister of the Republic of Estonia, who joins us online and invite you uh, for your introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, Mr. President, uh, distinguished host and the guests, their colleagues, um, what I want to stress uh, is indeed the wise uh, words what my Singapore uh, colleague stressed uh, and uh, I remember from these harsh times of coronavirus global crisis uh, when we uh, Estonia and Singapore jointly organized a uh, world conference how digital by digital technology means uh, fight coronavirus and how to share technological improvements uh, all over the world, uh, and uh, we formed also a particular declaration, global declaration on that matter, around 60 countries joined, and uh, this moral perspective of uh, scientific knowledge to help globally uh, um, ease uh, human sufferings, uh, I think this perspective uh, is very much what my colleagues stressed also today. What Chester is doing is truly unique and important for the whole of humanity. And this is a, indeed a moral perspective 
of uh, a future of mankind, what you are rising. And uh, I think that uh, mm, I would appreciate the Swiss colleagues for such a great initiative and for driving it forward. And it truly inspires it. Uh, uh, us, uh, and we need anticipatory and proactive look at science and analysis of how what boils in laboratories works for the benefit of humanity. And I would like to bring the knowledge of Chester's activities to Estonian scientists and to our region and hope that this will lead to exciting and useful collaboration. Um, we need to punch way above our current weight when it comes to doing science. And the sustainability and success of our digital society is very much dependent on the research and development we conduct so sustainable financing for R&D activities is pivotal, especially in ICT-related areas. Public-private partnership is one of the most essential tools to create innovation. And that is why industrial doctorate programs, for example, are becoming even more popular. And we have to realize the importance and need to cooperate internationally and to play our part in tackling global challenges. And therefore, science and digital diplomacy both help us to align our foreign policy efforts and unravel the common global problems that we face. We in Estonia already have great international cooperation initiatives. For example, the GovStack or the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions that by pooling resources and using them efficiently are making impactful changes. The focus on solving global problems has led top scientists to work on the link between plants and climate change, develop smart cities, probiotic bacteria, or novel energy solutions, create data processing solutions that protect privacy, and much more. Estonian main focus in research cooperation has been our immediate neighbors and European countries, but let me stress that in globalizing world, these cooperative relationships extend everywhere. There is no difference in that matter on physical distance. World is becoming smaller, uh, literally, mm, in these times, in these minutes. And one of the ideas the science carries is contributing to a better world, defending and renewing democratic values, I believe. Our, in Estonia, our e-government and e-state services provide citizens with a fast and direct way to participate and access services. As part of our technology diplomacy, we have provided these solutions to a large number of countries and have been recognized for our work. However, what drives science and scientific cooperation is trust. Trust between partners and trust in what the outputs of scientific work are used for. Today's world is a changed place. War has come to our doorstep in Estonia. And I think the, although the war, the Russian Federation aggression war against uh, Ukraine is not a world war, but it is a war in the world. It uh, has angles which make a difference to all parts of the world. And this trust has become a deficit. Russian, and let me stress that uh, Russian science is not the kind of bottom-up, freely forming system we are used to in Europe. Their universities and institutes are very clearly tied to the state commissions and state money. And hence part of the problem, results of Russian scientists' work has been used in aggression against Ukraine. And can we even be sure that this aggression has not used technology and knowledge that we have developed for peaceful purposes for a better future. We can't assure that. The world has changed and new solutions are expected from science diplomacy. And I'm sure we can all make our contribution in supporting our goals, in supporting our joint values and defending peace and just future of mankind.
And thank you very much indeed for the invitation to take part in this uh, event. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I remember uh, how you uh, asked uh, Estonia to participate in this event, and it was in the corridor of United Nations General Assembly meetings. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister Reinsalo, for joining us. And can I now turn to Her Excellency, Madame Al-Amiri, please. Your Excellency, Mr. President, thank you for this invitation to come to JISTA and for this excellent platform. <clears throat> First, I'd like to commend the organizers of JISTA in just three short years, and I, I love how you've had it here. You've been able to join two conversations that have never been joined before. The pulse of science together with the pulse of society. And address the key question, which is what is the role of diplomacy in fostering scientific findings? And what is the role of science in enabling diplomatic efforts? And if we are able to summarize, what are the three, what are the three basic concepts that enable science and technology to be part an, a, a driver for diplomacy and international relations. We need to first understand what areas it falls under. The first is technology and science needs to be a means for bilateral and multilateral uh, co conversations. Solutions have to be done utilizing science and technology for the core purpose that we all face fundamentally the same challenges growth of population, challenges that have to do with healthcare and the growth of pandemics as we move forward after COVID-19, access to secure food sources and diverse food sources, access to energy, and again, a diverse set of energy, sustainability, and I'm separating these two conversations for purposeful reasons, sustainability and impact of, the of, of reduction of climate change on society at large. These are all fundamental challenges that we all face as societies around the world, all faced from a different lens and all faced in a mechanism that we're only able to circumvent it and move forward from it by using scientific and technological advancements. And that is where the role of multilateralism and, and bilateralism comes into play as we have seen demonstrated in both the I2U2, which is a collaboration between India, uh, the United States, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates in bringing together solutions for energy, for diversifying economy, and for growth overall, utilizing science and technology. We see that also on multiple fronts where we are able to enable outcomes of science and technology to drive prosperity forward. For the second, science technology creates opportunity. It deploys solutions as part of our global uh, system. And this is something that needs to be developed at large. We need to look at this overarching mechanism of using scientific and technological outcomes to ensure that we don't politicize scientific outcomes, that in the absence of diplomatic ties, science remains a connection that connects nations together and enables us to have conversations and enables us to find modes and mechanisms to develop peacekeeping and to foster that moving forward. This is from a diplomacy perspective, but what about the science and technology perspective? Today, with the rapid growth of technological advancement, with the mechanisms by, by which technology is becoming not only vital to our lives, but the speed of advancement of technology of science is unprecedented. It means that there's a lot of unknowns that we are dealing with. And in the realm of unknowns, there's two reactions that we can have, fear and therefore prohibiting growth, or an understanding of the opportunities that science and technological advancement can create and the positive impact that it can create with an understanding of the ill uses of, of uh, scientific and technological outcomes coming into play. With this position, we need to be well aware to be able to proceed forward, so allowing science to move forward, and this is a choice that we all need to make, to allow the, the necessary framework for global collaboration to exist so we don't leave any nation behind, and to ensure that this technological advancement enables growth across countries and between countries. And 
when we talk about global legislation, I know there's a lot of conversation about data and data sharing, a lot of co concerns and conversation with regards to ethical issues and ethical uh, challenges as we move in progress with having a closer relationship between human society and technology. We need to address that from the lens that we do not know everything today, which is okay. We need to put st uh, some forms of, of mechanisms of working and governance mechanism with the awareness that we don't know everything. And therefore, it is okay to change, to be adaptive, to be transformative and move forward with that. And we need to also work very closely together to ask the right questions so that we're able to address them appropriately. For us, such as Justa, and hopefully other forests that come into play globally need to be venues for conversation where heads of states, politicians, heads of foreign affairs uh, offices, scientists, researchers, the private sector can actually sit at the same table, have a conversation around the questions that we pose in various sectors and be able to complementary work together, each with the lens that we bring on to be able to create that positive impact and change moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Minister. We will now hear the contribution of His Excellency Nasser Bourita, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Morocco. He meant to be online uh, with us, but ma had to attend the state opening of Parliament. That's why he sent us his message. <clears throat> Mr. President of the Swiss Confederation, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honorable participants. First, allow me to express my warmest thanks to Switzerland for the opportunity I'm given to contribute to this important summit. The past few years, and particularly the COVID-19 period, has highlighted the increasing relevance of human-machine interactions. The recent emergence of these new forms of interaction has been mainly featured by combination of quantum physics, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence with the traditional political, economical, social, and diplomatic sphere. While the interlinkage between these groundbreaking technologies are yet to be assessed, the international community hold the collective responsibility to read, it, to read it itself and make the best use of these new tools. Designing appropriate policy frameworks and responses are necessary today. On a global level, new technologies bring both challenges and opportunities. Challenges on the one hand, as the introduction of these technologies has the potential to question and even undermine the global security landscape. It accelerates arms race among states, strengthens the capabilities of dangerous non-state actors, and foster increasing cyber spy risks. It is also uh, an opportunity, on the other hand, as new technologies will impact conflict resolution and the diplomatic profession itself by allowing faster more secure and increasingly efficient decision-making decision and early warning processes. New technologies amount, therefore, to a true international issue par excellence. As such, it implies endangering the safety and security of nations and the entire international system in case it fails to face the risks of these new technologies. It implies also international cooperation and question multilateral diplomacy. For this reason, Morocco joins its efforts to make this initiative a success. Indeed, we are aware not only of the challenges that await us, but also of the potential gains that comes with early adaptation of these new technologies. In this spirit, Morocco has initiated several actions. His Majesty King Mohammed VI has ensured that Morocco is a part of this new dynamic, first by increasing the government, by 
creating the governmental portfolio dedicated to digital transition and administrative reform in the current government. Second, by instructing Morocco's Digital Development Agency to establish a strategic public institution and the draft international road, roadmap of artificial intelligence to support the evolution of these technology in Morocco. And by instructing the government to initiate multiple actions to support the emergence of an ecosystem of national players to accelerate the concrete applications of these new technologies to meet the needs of our society in health, education, agriculture, industry, and diplomacy. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today's challenges are transnational. The involvement of scientists in the political and diplomatic process is essential at time of accelerated changes. Therefore, the principles of inclusiveness and equal access to quantum technology and artificial intelligence must, must be grant, uh, guaranteed in order to benefit all humankind. More specifically, the potential use of new technologies for preventive diplomacy, peace, peacekeeping, and international development are critical to our future. In this regard, concrete actions and changes to, uh, to including uh, to the international legal regime and institutions are needed by considering setting up an international body dedicated to monitoring and controlling the use and applications of these new technologies, by exploring the idea of putting in place an international treaty convention to regulate the weaponization and proliferation of such technologies, and by focusing investments on the use of these technologies in preventive diplomacy. The challenges of today's world need scientific contribution to enable humanity to overcome the, the major threats they are facing. This, that is why we appreciate the initiative that gathers us today in a view of the launching of the Open Quantum Institute, which we hope will help us anticipate and promote the benefits that quantum science will offer. I thank you for your attention. I thank the Minister for his contribution and support of the GESTA work, in particular the, on the Open Quantum Institute, and turn to State Secretary Martina Hirayama of Switzerland, who is in charge of education, research and innovation. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to take up uh, three topics uh, and to point out uh, the role and importance of GESTA. First, anticipation, second, resilience, and third, sustainable development. To anticipate uh, challenges and opportunities as early as possible, that's important for the future. Scientists do this, researchers do this, but quite often it's uh, concentrated on their area of expertise. But it's important to have an overall picture, including different disciplines. This means also that uh, political, societal, and also legal aspects have to be anticipated. All the implications uh, for society are really important. And this is a role of uh, JESTA, to bring the worlds of uh, politics, uh, diplomacy, and science uh, together to uh, reflect uh, uh, on our future, on the challenges and opportunities. Resilience. Uh, during the last uh, two and a half years, uh, we had fast and dramatic changes. What is important uh, to achieve a resilient uh, society. Important is uh, basic research. Take as an example the development of mRNA. Uh, this is uh, not developed uh, within a year or two. 
a long period of basic research uh, was important uh, to be ready uh, when COVID-19 came up. And that's uh, the second thing which is important, that's the ability to identify and to transfer knowledge to be able to have products and to bring the products to the market. And uh, the third point uh, concerning resilience is to make knowledge, uh, to make know-how and to make products accessible. And that's also an important role of JESTA. And yesterday uh, you discussed about uh, the Open Quantum Institute. This is also about accessibility uh, of quantum technology uh, for, for the future. And uh, sustainable development, of course, uh, uh, is uh, another important point. And the Agenda 2030, yes, uh, we work hard on it, but we have to prepare the Agenda 2030 to 2045. Science, diplomacy, politics, have to set ambitious uh, and not only ambitious, also clear goals, what we want to achieve in the future. And JESTA could play and should play an important role in this context as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, State Secretary. And, and thank you all, ministers, Monsieur le Président, for, for your contributions. It, it seems to me that we have, when I'm listening to you, a, a great degree of convergence. Convergence on the challenges and the opportunities that are presented to us by this accelerated development, the convergence of science, the acceleration of technology. There is convergence on the objective of what we want to achieve, uh, a prosperous, equitable, just world where the contribution of science and technology has been brought to bear. And there is con convergence also in the analysis of the geopolitical reality and context uh, we are maneuvering in and which condition our context and our conduct, uh, rather, uh, in, in trying to go from A to B. So, so that poses the question, I feel, about the agency, our agency as states. How can we reconcile those different elements which bear a considerable tension uh, in order to move forward uh, together? And I think uh, that uh, with JESTA, we try to answer some of those questions by offering this platform of networks, uh, as it were. But uh, can I throw that question uh, into the room? Um, we seem to be aligned in our thinking. How can we have agency? So first is, is bringing science technology to the forefront of these discussions as one of the mechanisms and tools uh, for advancements, and that's on a national level, um, and being able to utilize that both uh, locally to be able to engage in having cooperation as one of the cornerstones of the development of the, tech, of the sector overall, and from an international perspective, bringing the conversation um, into our multilateral settings to be able to uh, move forward a lot of these um, questions that we are here to ask and, and the convergence, like you said, on, on where we're getting to. There are areas of technologies that have been put into the report and has been discussed throughout the course of the last three um, uh, days that are pretty much in discovery phase, which is great to be on our radar for discussion. There are those that could now be used and accessed as a mechanism of building solutions. Um, and that's an area that needs to be delved down. If science sits at the decision-making tab table on a national level, it is then, that's how we can enable that conversation to be percolated on an international cooperation level. And that's where it needs to start. Uh, start locally so that it can have the global impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. President. Let's try to make a step back this morning to the first um, lecture we had by Peter Maurer, and uh, it reminds me to the, uh, to the book of, uh, 
of Fukushima, the end of history. And it, it was, in fact, uh, in early, the beginning of the 90s, where uh, um, this book was written, and it was a bestseller worldwide. It uh, reflects the, uh, this moment in time um, of the 90s, where we thought that it was the end of history. It means every country in the world was uh, moving towards democracy, rule of law, and, and human rights. Well, we realized 30 years later that this is not the case, definitely not the case. Number of democracies, of democratic countries is decreasing, number of uh, autocratic countries is increasing. And um, this, um, why, why do, I, do I begin by this uh, lecture of the reality? Because uh, one of the main topic, of the main targets of GESDA is uh, to bring diplomacy and, and science together, these two words together, as uh, Madame uh, Irayama correctly said before in my eyes. And we have here in, uh, in Geneva the CERN, uh, who was the best example we had in the last 70, 80 years of bringing, of bringing science as a tool for diplomatic relation among countries, among states who were not able to share the same values and ideas. And uh, I guess we are in a similar uh, moment in time where we have to, re, to, re, to try again to use science as a tool to bring people together. This is one of the phases of science diplomacy. It is not, not just about science technology anticipating what... And the second is it exact that, the anticipating of the challenges. But um, actually, the, the main target for me is, is, of course, is to prepare humanity to the new technological challenges. But well, we are quite used to do that. We have been doing that for many centuries. The problem is how can we do that together, knowing that we are not everywhere like-minded? And we have to accept it, because this is reality. It was not the end of the world in the 90s. It was not the end of the history. So the, the world is developing. We are now reading the world. I had a good conversation, Gaston, with my colleague, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, about how do we read the geopolitical reality today, this region of influence. It is, it is deglobalization. And these regions are getting more and more diverse in their way of imagining of existing on this planet. And we have to, to, to take this into account in our, in our perception of the world and in our actions. And my dream is that, that JESTA will be a powerful tool uh, in uh, enabling uh, in a diverse world through science to make some steps ahead together in a peaceful way. So I, I, this is really my, my, my biggest dream about this, this foundation. And, and the second is, in fact, that we are preparing ourselves to avoid uh, monopolies or, uh, or concentration of powers through technology in um, oligarchic groups because this is, uh, again, history tells us this is a danger we always experience uh, during, uh, during history. So, just Thank you very much. Before I ask um, the Minister and the State Secretary to rejoin the, here, can I, based on what you say, Monsieur le Président, that we need to bring in different regions, different sensibilities, to go far afield again to Mexico? where Madame Marta Delgado, she is the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights, uh, sends us a message from that captures very well uh, this uh, challenge we share and we have started discussing here. I thank the organizers of the Guest Summit 2022 for their invitation to this high-level panel in representation of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. It is significant that Geneva hosts this initiative as the headquarters of a numerous specialized international and regional organizations, including CERN itself, which is directly and indirectly linked 
to the issue of quantum technologies within its broad portfolio of projects. The human ability to create tools and knowledge is one of the factors that has allowed for the emergence and accelerated development of our civilization. This ability has also endangered our own existence and that of our planet. Scientific uh, advancement and uh, new technologies produces social, economic, cultural and political and also environmental transformations. Technology can therefore be the barrier of progress and hope, but also of damage and destruction when it is used uh, is uh, inappropriate. That is why diplomacy and particularly the multilateralism must not only go hand in hand with these changes, but also be able to anticipate them in order to generate better decision making, regulate both is positive uh, negative effects and channel them towards the common good of humanity. Mexico is a country with a firm conviction that cooperation and diplomacy are essential to find common solutions to shared challenges and has been evidenced by the crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, among other challenges. This highlight the importance of integrating scientific research and data management and evaluation from the various disciplines of knowledge at the center of decision making at the international level, guiding mitigation, evidence-based response and recovery strategies. For example, the development in uh, record time of vaccines against COVID-19 which allowed them to be applied on time is largely due to international scientific cooperation enabled by diplomacy, thus saving millions of lives. However, this situation has also revealed that multilateral efforts must be coordinated to ensure results uh, that are not only efficient, but also equitable for the benefit of the entire international community and not just some states. The Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by the United Nations Organization uh, in 2015 as an universal call to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that uh, by 2030 all people enjoy peace and prosperity. As the UNDP itself has highlighted, the creativity, knowledge, technology and financial resources of the entire society are necessary to achieve the SDGs in all contexts. So it is necessary that access to scientific information is not the privilege of a minority and that is uh, use is not contrary to the very principles of the multilateral system. Reconciling both principles without restricting the freedom of research is a great challenge, but it makes it more evident that requires effort and a specialized multilateral diplomacy. In this sense, I welcome the timely initiative of the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. And uh, we reiterate that Mexico uh, is committed to the advancement of science and technology cooperation for the benefit of humankind. Thank you very much, Madame Delgado, who also says, uh, beyond the elements we had already discussed here, and the general objective, is that the proof is in the pudding, in the sense that we need to have results and produce um, the effect and the objectives we actually want, which brings me back to uh, the questions of agency. Well, the President mentioned history. And the point I want to make is that there is a two-way cause and effect between science and technology. On one hand, politics, economy, and society on the other hand. I'll give you a few examples. 10,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution. Basically, rice, in Asia, India and China, wheat in Mesopotamia and then moving up into Europe, potatoes in Peru, 
maize in Mexico, corn. And it is the invention of intensive cultivation of these staples that created our ancient societies. Fast forward 1440, the Gutenberg Press, movable type, and the ability to print pamphlets thousands of a day instead of hand copying. Disrupted politics, disrupted the church, the Reformation, and of which Geneva played pivotal <laughs> played, role. Played a role, yes. And then move a bit forward to the age of enlightenment. I think it's about 1685 to about 19th century. And that really was the basis for the Industrial Revolution, which began in Europe. That's the reason we're speaking English today, instead of Arabic or Chinese or an Indian language. Right? The point is, every time you get a confluence of science and technology, it's an inflection point that disrupts society. And the point I wanted to make is, actually, we are now at another inflection point. For the first time in human history, computing and communication, if you think about the printing press, what computation and communication, digital communication has done is that the cost of copying and <coughs> transmitting knowledge, the marginal cost is zero. <laughs> what artificial intelligence has done is that it used to be that human beings had a monopoly on pattern recognition, which is the basis for language, for literature, for communication, and now machines can do it. That's why they can translate, they can recognize images, and a lot of the impact from that has been created. And then the other point is autonomous systems. And actually for war, beyond nuclear weapons, the other big anxiety is lethal autonomous <coughs> weapons. So I'm just giving you a few examples to try to make the case that we are at such an inflection point. And again, if you think about history and think about the time before the First World War, it was also a time of globalization and technological advancement. But it was also a time, certainly in Europe, when you had the Ottoman Empire crumbling, the Habsburg Empire also undergoing its own travails. You had the Germanic powers, both in Germany, and you had the Russian and the Slavic Empire with his own designs. And of course, the Balkans caught in between. My worry as a foreign minister is whether we are actually sleepwalking into a period <coughs> very analogous to before the First World War, when science and technology, social and political disruption, and empires waxing and waning. And if we are in such a moment, then this is a moment of profound danger. But the reason I'm here and to make the argument for agency for small states is that whilst we do not control the agendas in Washington, Beijing, or Moscow, it doesn't mean Switzerland and UAE and Singapore have no agency. And as far as science and technology is concerned, we should be asking ourselves the following questions. What critical mass of people is needed to be able to generate new inventions and translate new ideas into products and services? Now, maybe I think five and a half million is too small. I think even eight million is too small. But if we can find a large enough network to achieve that critical mass where the exchange and intercourse of ideas and competition can generate this, 
we are still in the game, even though we are not a superpower. The other point, and Jester again has struck on the right note, it's actually about open science. You know, you, I, I know you're launching the Open Quantum Institute. And the key point here is this. Paradoxically, although we all talk about the personal computer and the internet and connection, actually for the next bound of digital technologies, AI for instance, we're actually more centralized because there's no way you can do enough computation on your laptop. So in fact, we need access to sufficient computing power, centralized and shared, and to have that ability to work together on that common stack, hopefully of op open technologies, but at the same time provide enough <coughs> incentives for commercial enterprises to participate. Jesta is not going to invent quantum computing or even create the infrastructure. But insofar as you can create an environment conducive to access and sharing and collaboration and competition, then there is a chance. So my point is that regardless of the decisions made by superpowers, if we can get together on open collaborative platforms, we have a chance. And we have a chance, even as our societies are disrupted, hopefully, to move into a better, fairer, more peaceful and more prosperous phase. So as I believe as scientists and diplomats, we have to tune ourselves to be more optimistic sometimes and not be bogged down by fear and anxiety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minfu. And, and in a sense, I must uh, uh, confess, you have answered the last question I was going uh, to pose to the panel, uh, namely, what is your word of advice and guidance uh, to Jesta as they embark on their scaling up uh, and are going to present to a wider public as they have done uh, during this summit, the two uh, solutions that are far advanced on the Open Quantum Institute and the global curriculum in science diplomacy. But you have exactly now provided this uh, uh, guidance, uh, which I'm sure Jesta will, will take up. But um, Madame Hirayama. Thank you very much. So we've heard a lot about the enormous potential we have uh, with uh, uh, the research activities concerning AI, uh, quantum technologies, and so on. And I think we have uh, to, to reflect in what way we want to use these new uh, opportunities uh, we have, uh, we as societies. Uh, and we also have to respect uh, the ethical, the legal uh, aspects in this context. And so an important role of JESTA is to help to build bridges. So actually, scientists and researchers, innovators, they want to answer questions, to find new questions, to develop new products. So they are open. And uh, we should use this to build bridges, and not only in the easy situations. These bridges should help to communicate between different cultures, different societies. And uh, there I see the opportunities also for the international and multilateral cooperation, and also for uh, organizations like, like, like JESTA. And that's my hope and my wish uh, that uh, you support us in building these bridges uh, to have a prosperous uh, future. Thank you very much. And this uh, guidance is well noted. <laughs> Madame la Ministre. Uh, moving it forward, I think, across different realms of discussion. Today, um, there was a very uh, direct outcome with regards to quantum computing, which is great. The same thing with regards to science diplomacy. Uh, for the GISTA team to take on these conversations that we don't have a venue to actually discuss. Um, one of the important aspects that we need to talk about is data. Uh, and the collection of data, the interoperability of the systems that analyze them and the outcomes that comes from it, especially to inform discussions on 
um, climate change to inform discussions on agricultural development uh, and to also inform discussions on access to energy. Um, the second is a discussion on what should remain open for science and technological outcomes and what aspects could be proprietary uh, knowledge, and that's uh, in terms of discussion. And the third, with regards to diplomacy and something that you spoke about, Mr. President, which is um, how do you still enable, with the current state of geopolitics today, allow for science to be a means of communication and a means of dialogue and a means of creation and fostering uh, of relationships? Thank you very much. Merci. Mm -hmm. Minister, do you... On, on top of your <laughs> fundamental guidance do you have? No, I, I think we should think about marginal costs. With renewable energy, imagine a world where the marginal cost of energy trends towards zero. In such a world, actually the marginal cost for computation, including quantum computation, will also trend down. It will not be zero, but it will trend down. The cost of communication, essentially marginal cost is zero. Right? Now, there's one other big change, and here I want to talk about biology because the president and I are both doctors, that even bioinformatics, even genomics, has been reduced in a sense to an information science. That's why the Human Genome Project, which costs billions of dollars today to sequence any of us, it's hundreds of dollars, and it will fall. And therefore, its impact on healthcare and customized treatment. But actually, there's another big looming Frankenstein, which was written across the bay, which is that for the first time in human history, we can edit the genome. And it's one thing to edit somatic changes, which means you affect the individual, but when we get to editing germline cells, inheritable changes, it's the first time ever in human history, or in fact, in the universe, that a species is capable of self-editing. And at that point, human nature changes. Think Merci. about that. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, Monsieur le Président de la Confédération. Thank you, <coughs> Ambassador Fazl. Well, in fact, what, uh, what my colleague, uh, even professional colleague Vivian from Singapore, <laughs> told is, is very much com compatible, aligned with my, with my dream I expressed before, uh, making out of, uh, of Dresda uh, an interconnecting tool. And uh, we, we are in Switzerland here, but uh, we are here in, in the International Geneva, which is a little bit more than just Switzerland. <laughs> it is a platform for discussion. Geneva is supposed to be the capital, the world capital of discussion about governance. And we are now um, combining governance, political governance, <clears throat> with uh, digitalization and uh, coming up to new forms of uh, dealing with this uh, digital governance uh, being based on quantum sciences and, and on artificial intelligence. And uh, Geneva, the international Geneva is known worldwide for being the capital of uh, <clears throat> the humanitarian international law, which we are uh, depository state of. Uh, it was the 90th centuries, and in 20th centuries we had uh, um, made many advances in the human rights, and we created the Human Rights Council of the UN here in Geneva. And, and, and my second dream is that uh, this anticipatory science diplomacy uh, branch will be the, the main uh, topic of the International Geneva, at least in these decades, in this very decades of, of, of big incertitudes, of, of big geopolitical reassessment of the world after the, the fall of the wall uh, in, in Berlin. Second point, so it means it, it has a central role, a central function, and this is not just by the way that the Swiss government decided to create it, it's not an NGO, it is a governmental organization, 
but I come up to the second point, uh, made together by, 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 by Swiss, by cantonal of state of Geneva, city of Geneva, uh, and, and the many different multilateral agencies that are uh, working also with, uh, with us here in Geneva, and, and, and the NGOs, of course. And the second point is exactly that. We were told this morning by Peter Maurer that the uh, uh, building bridges is maybe not anymore uh, the golden standard of, of getting in touch, of connecting each other. We, were, we are willing to, to speak about, to speak of platforms, of uh, uh, networking. And uh, what we are experiencing here today in this room is a networking of a political level together with uh, many states that are represented virtually or, uh, in, uh, or uh, physically, and uh, NGOs, uh, multilateral agencies, and so on. And Geneva exactly organized itself with two fora, with a forum, diplomatic forum, a scientific forum, which are supposed to coordinate this representation, this, this really very broad approach in the base, and this mix of bringing people together, together with also the political level by this second edition of, of the forum, is in my eyes exactly the expression of this platform. So we have absolutely to continue that way in order to bring, I, I mean, I participate, I don't know to how many meetings in the world, almost among politicians with you, the friends, but you wouldn't be there. And I think this second point is, is, is extremely important and I want to, uh, to emphasize it. And the third and, and last point, um, yes, we have to be brave and a little bit optimist about the future. I totally agree with you. Uh, we were used to live in a I told you before, in a world who was automatically increasing towards democracy, towards human rights, the end of history, as I said before. And suddenly we realize it is not the case. Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, Ukraine, the security uh, uh, bomb now in, in, in Europe. Uh, nevertheless, we have tools and we have to be able to use these tools to work together towards a better world including, and this is the huge challenge, I want to express it very clearly, including accepting or dealing with the diversity. It is easy to speak together under like-minded. It is less easy under unlike-minded. And every human being and every democratic society has, must have the freedom to organize themselves. This is called democracy. I do not choose democracy just in the moment whose the majority of population is thinking like me. I have to accept and choose my democracy even if the majority of population is not thinking like me. And I feel that this was one of the mistakes we made in the last, in the last 20 years. We were speaking about inclusion that we were excluding those not thinking like us. And uh, I guess this is a topic where science, science diplomacy can help us to, uh, to go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here today. Can I, can I join uh, the, uh, um, ask the audience in joining me to thank uh, the panelists here in Geneva, but also the ministers that joined us uh, electronically uh, for your participation, for the positive assessment of what GESTA is uh, doing, as GESTA as a method, but GESTA also as an incubator of solution pathways. Um, but also thank you uh, for the guidance uh, through that rich thinking you have contributed uh, today, which will uh, certainly condition just as further work in the coming year. And can I invite you with 
all the audience to come back next year because I, I think it is important that this segment here becomes a, a permanent feature of the summit, that we have the scientific discussion but also the political accompaniment of what Gesta is trying to achieve. And with that, bravo et merci. Thank you. I really appreciate it very and, much. And while Thank the ministers you. are uh, going you, back President. into the room, can I please great ask the president of the really. foundation board to conclude this year's summit? <laughs> well, we are coming to the end of three days, which I hope, for, I hope were very interesting for all of us. I personally was very impressed. If I compare this year's summit with last year's summit, and I would have to point out what is the biggest difference, I think it was the depth of the discussion. Uh, last year we were a little bit on the uh, superficie because we really didn't yet know what it all is about. So, I mean, the participation was more about uh, is it really worthwhile? Are we going? This year the participation was deep. And I can assure you one thing. Uh, your input is going to be the base for our work for the next uh, year. And we will continue uh, to work based on, 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 on what you are thinking about it. And I am including also the young persons uh, who were talking this morning to us. And of course, the uh, input from the political environment. Um, I'm not going to make any resume here. I'm only going to take advantage of thanking. And the first one, of course, is to thank uh, President uh, Ignacio Cassis and his colleagues, uh, the ministers who have been participating here, and uh, for the first time, as I said, have brought now the political perspective into the work of Shesta. I also uh, would like to thank the different institutions and people. Uh, first of all, thanks our founders. I said it's not only the Swiss government, federal government, it's also the government and the, can uh, the canton of the canton and the city of Geneva. And then let me thank you uh, to our philanthropic partners in Geneva and throughout the world. I think La Fondation Bois-Genève, which is very, very important. La Asuera Stiftung in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, La Compagnia di San Paolo in Torino, who was very active and helping us a lot, the King Baudin Foundation in Brussels, and the Open Society Foundations in New York City, all of them have become strategic partners and very decisive for our work. I would also like to thank our support, especially our two core partners that we have here in Geneva, uh, the one is the, the UN Environment, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and his personal envoy on technology, Ambassador Amadi Singh Gil, who have been very active during those days here, and the Director of the UN Office in Geneva, Mrs. Tatiana Valovaya, uh, and all the permanent representatives and the Directors General of the International Organization and their staff here in Geneva, who have all of them being part actively in our work. And then the X Prize Foundation, uh, the, to her founder, Anush Ansari, and the chairman, Peter Diamond, this, who just installed their European headquarter here in Geneva and are holding today the first European summit of their institution here in Geneva. And finally, let me give a warm thank you to what we call the Chester community which is engaging all over the world and free of charge. I have to mention this. Uh, none of our scientists has any remuneration. All of them are working free of charge for being part uh, to our achievements. And they are giving us not only the work free of charge, but an incredible, immense level of energy. Uh, I would especially like to mention the two co-chairmen of the scientific forum, Joel Meso and Martin Vetterli, and as I said, more than thousands of scientists all over the world. 
The chair of the Diplomacy Forum, Michael Muller, and all the members of the Diplomatic Forum, all the scientific moderators who signed off the RADA. Uh, into to, into, uh, they are only the signing off the RADA were 707 scientists who have put their signature and they are uh, uh, supporting this RADA and saying what is in there, that's really what is happening. I think all the academic and diplomatic co-chairs of our task forces working now on the solutions, and they are Matthias Troya and Anushesh Ansari, Martin Chungong and uh, Marga Gual uh, Solea, Olaf Blanke and Lydia Brito, Gerhard Haug and Jim Snabe, Wendy Lee Queen and Sergio Mujica, Rudiger Urbanke and Darren Tank, Dirk Helbing and Sean Cleary, Samir Akiani and Peter Maurer. And of course, I want to thank also my colleagues of the Chester Board who are all actively participating and all the members of the executive team who have been doing an incredible work. I mean, just want to point out the executive team, the team of Chester in this uh, first period were nine people, that's all. And they have been able to produce all what you see here. I think it is really extraordinary what this team has achieved. And last, uh, last but not least, of course, I want to thank all the speakers who were here with us and the 1,400 participants, which were you. Uh, finally, we had to close in the subscription in August because we were just overwhelmed with the amount of people who wanted to participate. And finally, we just received the latest figures uh, you were 1,400 people, 700 people physically here, and 700 people participating. So thanks to all of you. And I just want to say that uh, we are already looking forward for our next summit. Now that we have the okay from the federal government and from our founders, that we have a 10-year period in front of us. This, of course, is a big, big uh, change from moving from a scale-up, from a start-up to a scale-up uh, thing. And if you want to take down already the notes, it will be from October 11th to October 13th, 2023, that we will welcome you again. Most probably not here, because we are becoming, the room is becoming too small, but we have uh, good, good uh, perspective that perhaps we can next year be in the new facilities of the CERN building, which I think is also a, a, a good symbol uh, when, if we can move over there. So have a safe journey back. Thank you very much. And uh, let's all together go on using the future to build the present. Thank you very much. <clears throat>